Hello everyone, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 236, part B, or part 2. Um, you know why you're here, so let's roll straight into question time. Nick Brodar asks, It's often said that amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. How did the US Navy develop its overwhelming logistical superiority? Partly, it's sheer industrial power that allowed it to actually build a logistical fleet, and partly also necessity, because when you look at the three major powers in the interwar period, and you look at logistics, well, the US Navy wasn't too involved in World War One, which is why we're not considering it there. But once you get into World War Two, in the run-up to that, the Japanese have actually developed a surprisingly capable resupply at sea capability for the period uh, they use it to get to Pearl Harbor for example but most of their objectives lie within the combat range of their ships sailing from Japan and the ones that are further out rely on them basing out of areas that they've captured such as a uh, Singapore or truck or Rabaul etc etc so the Japanese are less constrained by the need to develop logistical capabilities because they're within a you know they're within a given sailing distance now of course that does lead to them somewhat neglecting the more physical supply side of things as opposed to fuels um so you know troops guns ammunition and that does come back to bite them but um the british have a reasonable amount of logistical capability but because and they have a lot of distance to cover because they have an empire but they have a vast, vast network of bases. So they don't need a absolutely massive fleet train because if the fleet needs a lot of resupply, in theory, they can go back and resupply at a base, which is a lot easier to stock up with regular convoy shipments and so forth. And if they need uh, something brought out to them, then you don't need a particularly huge amount of shipping to get something from, say, Alexandria to Crete or Gibraltar to partway into the Western Mediterranean, and so on and so forth. So whilst the Royal Navy has a fairly advanced logistical service, it's primarily concerned with just shuttling bits to and from uh, various bases, or relatively short-range hops out to active units. The US, on the other hand, whilst it has this kind of splendid isolation thing going, being most of the North American continent has the additional issue of if it wants to go out and exert its will against anybody it's likely to be exerting its will against, it has to cross one of two oceans and the most likely scenario for them is the Pacific, which is the biggest ocean on the planet, and the enemy is on the other side of it. And that means that, well, just look at a map in the of the Pacific, there's not exactly a huge number of places you can use as resupply stops as you head over from the west coast of the US to the Western Pacific Combat Theater. The only real exception being Pearl Harbor, which is why it gets used as such, um, but therefore out of necessity, not only are US ships forced to be a little bit more longer ranged than the average vessel, but they are forced to realise that if they want to keep their ships refuelled at sea, if they want to keep their ships resupplied at sea, they're going to need fairly large logistical ships, and they, those ships are going to have to go a fair distance, which increases their size still more, because it's easy to make a short-range high-capacity logistical ship, but you've now got to make a long-range high-capacity logistical ship, then you've got to make a lot of them, because you have a fleet to supply, and then you have to take into account that you might have to be doing this in two oceans, so you've got to, that multiplies even more. And plus, you still have to have that kind of back end that resupplies and restocks your bases, like Pearl Harbor and then later Espiritu Santo, etc., etc. And thus, you end up with the logistics fleet that the U.S. has by the end of World War II, because they've, they've been forced to go down that route somewhat by necessity in the interwar period, and then once war comes, they have the industrial might to actually build that up to support the fleet that they're building up. Paul from Chicago asks, I was reading an article on German coal use in World War I. The author stated in 1913, 80% of British exports by weight were coal. What percentage of, a ship, of ships under the Red Ensign were colliers? And where could I go looking to find that out? I mean, the 
export my weight is entirely possible if you look at the summary for the world's mineral import export lists in uh, 1913 britain is exporting 73 million tons of coal per year at that time and when you look at all the other stuff including things like iron ore i mean obviously it's a mineral import export list but the total numbers of britain exports from all the others don't even come close to that amount of coal so yeah th that's an entirely possible percentage by weight if not by value because of course coal is a relatively speaking low value high volume cargo um, in terms of what percentage of the ships under the red ensign were colliers not as much as that figure would suggest not by a long shot um, where would you go looking to find that out i'd probably suggest lloyd's register um, they should have you know, all of their as the name suggests all the documentation for insured ships under the red ensign at the time um, alternatively you could look at merchant ship or merchant navy crew lists and log books which are available on a number of websites but i would think lloyd's register is probably the easiest one to go through because they'll just have lists of ships and t alongside the ship name will be the ship type might be a bit of a long bit of work to go through but the reason i say you're not looking at 80% of the British merchant fleet being colliers is because the vast majority of British coal exports went to the continent. So an awful lot of that trade was done by a relatively small number of colliers that were just pinging back and forth between Britain and the European ports with some fewer long distance coal ships that were going overseas, particularly to restock British naval bases and so forth, and therefore the majority of the oceanic going merchant fleet would not have been colliers because they would be concerned with all the other stuff that britain is importing and exporting across long distances where the coal trade is going to be a significantly smaller impact on things michael griffith asks is there a resource for someone to see what a ship looks like at range for instance what would a cruiser look like at three thousand yards I'm not aware of any significant online resource that does that. If anyone is aware, then please let us know in the comments below. Um, the only place that I found that kind of formally tabulates this is what a ship looks like at this range and this range and this range and this range um, tends to be things like gunnery instruction manuals and spotting manuals for various navies. Now, the ones from world war one and world war two there may be some copies online that you could have a look at or you could hunt one down a physical copy um but that's the only place i can sort of guarantee that i've seen that kind of thing before um the other thing you can do albeit it's a little bit imprecise and crude is to look at something like google earth and with their 3d mode on if you find a museum ship that is vaguely close to the water or has a relatively flat um, uh, terrain between it and the water, um, or if you want to try and see what it looks like from slightly above the water, use the air, ver air view. Um, and then if you kind of fix yourself directly above it and then scroll to your appropriate angle and then start zooming out, it will actually tell you like how far away you are on in one of the menus and then you can approximate based on that but um that's that's a little as i have a little bit of a crude method and also that's what uh the ship looks would look like approximately speaking uh to the human eye as opposed to through a rangefinder or binoculars or whatever um but uh, yeah that that would be apart from, apart from that you can obviously look at uh, historic photos where the range is actually known and uh, have a look uh, and see what those would suggest to you but unfortunately as i said i'm personally not aware of any significant online resource that sort of goes right here is a cruiser at this distance here's a cruiser at that distance and so forth bfw asks what are your thoughts with hindsight on the value of treaty era heavy cruisers was the expense in both money and material worth it i mean it kind of depends a little bit on the navy but broadly, I would say yes. Um, now, some of that, to be honest, is kind of the the law of opposition, i.e. if your opponent has something, you probably want to have the nearest available counter to it or the similar thing 
because if you don't then the enemy has an additional tool to use against you so for some nations um building heavy cruisers in the interwar period is valuable because if they don't then well their opponents or potential opponents will build heavy cruisers and then they will be at a disadvantage treaty era heavy cruisers do of course have a lot of issues because as i've indicated in the past you could probably just about get a balanced dish treaty heavy cruiser at the time the treaty is actually written but uh, as time goes on with the need for heavier and heavier protection and heavier and heavier anti-aircraft armament and so forth it becomes progressively harder and harder to actually get a balanced treaty cruiser. I usually point to the Baltimores as basically being the US going, well, we've got the New Orleans class, we've got Wichita, which you can see here. Um, they're not ideal, but when it comes to having nine, eight inch guns and a cruiser, heavy cruiser's top speed, you see the a massive amount of displacement increase there is on the Baltimores just to be able to fit decent protection and an anti-aircraft battery. But when you consider it overall, heavy cruisers, as compared to light cruisers, are capable of doing a reasonable amount of damage to capital ships at short to medium ranges. Um, okay, they can't necessarily pierce the belt of most capital ships. Well, they can for a few, um, but they can still do a, re a reasonable amount of damage regardless. So, you know, you have things like um, San Francisco taking on Hie in the Guadalcanal campaign you have Dorsetshire but going after Bismarck and then when it comes to smaller ships uh, you have the fact that Exeter is able to damage Graf Spey in a way that Ajax and Achilles can't and then when you get into cruiser versus cruiser warfare whilst in theory at closer ranges a more heavily gunned six inch ship i.e. 12 15 guns can go toe to toe with a treaty compliant eight inch cruiser the eight inch cruiser still does have an advantage at longer ranges so you see this in the mediterranean where british light cruiser forces are sometimes forced to fall back on heavier forces when they're facing off against italian heavy cruisers even if the italian heavy cruisers technically are outnumbered because the italian heavy cruisers with their eight inch guns can reach out at considerably greater effective ranges and of course the 8-inch shell, if it lands, will do a bit more damage than the 6-inch. You've also got, as I mentioned in the first half of this dry dock, the margin of superiority that a heavy cruiser has over a merchant raider, when most merchant raiders top out at 6-inch guns, or nearest equivalent, where a 6-inch gun cruiser obviously therefore has a slightly smaller advantage. So overall, they the treaty here are heavy cruisers are pretty valuable, and necessary but um, some of the roles in which you might have thought of them in the 1920s are perhaps better served by the lighter cruisers particularly anti-destroyer work a, a ship with 12 or 15 6 inch guns is going to be at a considerable advantage dealing with destroyer attack than a heavy cruiser with eight or nine eight inch guns sebastian asks did high altitude bombing attacks ever hit a ship underway and trying to evade. Moored ships like Arizona and Tirpitz were destroyed whilst at anchor, but was that success ever repeated against a moving target? Hits, yes, and sinkings, qualified, yes. So when you're talking about high altitude bombing in World War II against ships, you're usually talking basically about effectively level bombing, because it could be level bombing at a few thousand feet, it could be level bombing at 10, 15, 20,000 feet, but you get the idea. So uh, quite a number of ships were, in fact, damaged by level bombers. HMS Repulse, before she was hit by torpedo bombers, as can be seen in this photo, did take a single hit. You can see where she took the hit um, down there on the bottom left, and you can see the smoke coming off of the hit because uh, she's up there on the top right by the time the photo is taken. Now, it was very difficult to hit a ship using level bombing, but if you dropped enough bombs and you had a skilled enough crew or crews, inevitably statistics were going to catch up with you eventually. At USS Marblehead, of course, we covered that a few weeks ago, and she was also hit by level bombers. Uh, HMS Cossack, also hit by a level bomber, and uh, in that case actually sunk. However, as a rule, 
the sheer number of bombs you have to throw at a maneuvering and evading ship in order to hit it generally means that a you have to use a lot of aircraft and b those aircraft are generally carrying relatively small weapons as opposed to you know a thousand pounder or two thousand two hundred pounder or a twelve thousand pounder in the case of a tall boy um which in turn means that most level bombing attacks are not going to sink a ship the only ships that tend to be sunk by level bombing attacks whilst they are actively evading tend to be destroyers that are vulnerable to you know one or two hits and that's it they're done anyway uh, now obviously you do have ships like repulse which are hit by level bombing and then are subsequently sunk by other means uh, but it's very in repulse's case the bomb hit had nothing to do with whether or not she was hit by torpedoes and in most cases where you have that kind of combined attack, it's incredibly rare for the bombs to have any real effect on the later attacks. Very, very, very rarely a ship, especially you know, a small cruiser or a large destroyer, might be crippled by a level bombing hit and then subsequently finished off by other means. But when you compare number of bombs dropped to number of hits gained level bombing as compared to dive bombing and torpedo bombing or even rockets is probably the single least efficient way of damaging or destroying a vessel so yes it does happen but it requires a huge amount of expenditure of effort or insane amounts of luck richard Hsu asks japanese submarines were often critical in sinking major allied assets with i-19 sinking wasp and damaging north carolina i-175 sinking liskam bay and i-168 finishing off yorktown seeing that japanese submarine attacks accounted for two of the four u.s fleet carriers sunk as well as heavy damage to several other major combat vessels why didn't Japan invest more in submarine warfare to patrol and sink more U.S. naval assets? For example, it seems at crucial battles like Leyte Gulf and Iwo Jima that Japanese could have done more damage with submarine attacks than with surface combatants. What was the main reason Japan did not utilize submarines more? The Japanese did actually send their submarines primarily against Allied warships. That was basically their doctrine pre-war, and it's the doctrine they tried to stick to during the war which is partially why they got this level of success um, they had a fairly extensive submarine fleet the submarines in general were fairly large fairly well armed and fairly long range now granted they did go off to do other things like uh, annoying australian harbors and so forth but a lot of japanese submarine combat deployments were done with the objective of finding and sinking warships the problem that they faced in doing so was twofold firstly it turned out that a convoy or formation whatever you want to call it of warships is generally protected by a lot of smaller warships which generally specialize in anti-submarine warfare there'll be a far far higher concentration of destroyers and later on destroyer escorts as well surrounding a fleet that includes carriers and battleships than you'll find on a typical merchant convoy which makes those formations something of a difficult target plus those formations tend to move considerably faster than your average merchant convoy which makes them rather difficult to actually catch plus the other well, there are a few other issues one of which is you know intelligence and routing uh, so the Japanese will quite often deploy their submarines in picket lines across what they thought were going to be the known paths of advance of U.S. formations. And sometimes, like with WASP and North Carolina, that worked. And other times they just guessed wrong because warship formations, unlike convoys, can be a little bit more free in the routing they take. And of course, if you have good signals intel and you know that Japanese submarines are being deployed to a certain area... In the wide expanses of the Pacific, it's not that difficult or particularly revealing of your intelligence to just quietly signal the fleet in question to go, well, you know, you might want to alter course 10 degrees to port and uh, just stay on that course for a day or two and then head back towards your normal course and that will just end up bypassing the entire Japanese submarine line and they don't know where you've gone. As far as they're concerned, they just got their course estimations off by a few degrees. And with the speed, it's not just 
catching them in the first place, but with convoy attacks, you would try and attack at night and then um, catch up later on. So you could either attack submerged during the day or on the surface at night, but then you could follow the convoy for a bit, and then at night, the following night, you could get on the surface, race round to the front, and try and attack again. With a military convoy or a fleet that's travelling considerably faster, you get a one-and-done deal, assuming that you don't get sunk by the anti-submarine assets. So going after military targets was just a lot, lot more difficult. And it became exponentially more so as the war went on and Allied anti-submarine warfare efforts got more and more effective. Michael Gilson asks, In the late 60s and early 70s, when the last of the World War II configuration ships were being sold out of reserve for scrap, what did they go for? Would it have been economically feasible to buy some to rent out to film studios or operate as a private museum? I'm sure that even a scrap Franklin and Bunker Hill would cost too much, but what about something like Commencement Bay? Likewise, an Atlanta class would probably cost too much, but what about one or two of the diesel-powered destroyer escorts? Generally, ships tended to go to the scrapyard at that point for a few tens of thousands of dollars, maybe a bit more uh, in the best cases for the Navy. Um, sometimes, and quite often, they'd just go for a notional dollar. However, and this is something I've discovered uh, relatively recently speaking to various museum ship staff, there are a few complications with uh, that kind of thing. Because, you know, it might seem really obvious, well, if the US Navy is selling this old warship for a dollar, well, I'll give them a dollar and then I have a warship. <laughs> and unfortunately, it doesn't work quite that way um, for two reasons. One, when you have these relatively cheap, you know, dollar to ten thousand dollar or whatever sales, the Navy apparently, at least talking about the US Navy, apparently will specify that it can only be sold for this price for the purposes of scrapping and to someone who actually has the capability of scrapping it. So if a scrap yard owner shows up with a dollar, they'll sign the contract with them. If you show up with a dollar, even if your dollar is much shinier and nicer looking than theirs, they won't even give you a second glance. Another problem is that if you do somehow manage to persuade the Navy to sell you the ship or give even give you the ship as a museum, um, regardless of whatever monetary transaction is involved, the Navy will still claim a certain degree of control and or ownership, depending on the exact time period, over the vessel in question. So you will have things like mandatory dry docking, um, uses that you can and cannot put it to, etc. and so on. Plus, you've also got to deal with issues of, you know, does the machinery work? Um, given that it's a World War II era ship that's been in reserve for a while, you know, what bits have decayed, how much asbestos do you have to seal up, um, and so on and so forth. And then you've got the, all the ongoing maintenance costs apart from the sort of semi-mandatory dry dockings and, and such like. So economically feasible to buy some warships to rent out to film studios or operate as private museums, you might, if you were lucky, for something like a destroyer escort or a destroyer or maybe even, well, I don't think there would have been any escort carriers floating around by the 60s or 70s, um, but something small, you might have been able to persuade the Navy to let you take control of it for museum purposes, but the ongoing maintenance and upkeep costs of such vessels even if you were you know getting money from occasional film rentals and private museum uh, operations would probably break most individuals large companies and organizations sure um they could probably do it but th th there is a certain minimum threshold to owning and operating a museum ship that is actually quite high unless you do something like I occasionally have the idea to do, which is just to you know, buy a plot of land near a relatively large waterway, dig a socking great hole, um, float my newly acquired ex-warship into said hole and then fill it all up again and turn it into a 
big house, but, you know, that's a separate matter entirely. Although, with that said, given that most museum ships, for obvious reasons, generally end up having to turn a profit, otherwise they go under, so therefore indicating museum ships can be made profitable, um, and if they are making a loss, in theory, for a large organisation, that would be a tax-deductible write-off, I, I do wonder why the really big um, you know, mega corporations that really, really like their tax write-offs and also like to look good for PR purposes haven't made more museum ships. I mean, yeah, you know, making something like John F. Kennedy or CVN 65 Enterprise a museum ship is hilariously impractical for most of us mere mortals, but I'm pretty sure Apple or Microsoft could probably afford it and given how little they like paying taxes even if they operated at a loss it would still be a spectacular bit of pr and a good way to write off their taxes as well oh no now now they're probably going to go and do it this this uh, giant supercarrier sponsored by verizon wireless <laughs> oh no connor johnson asks if you were able to save one british capital ship at the end of world war ii that isn't war spite what would it be? AKA, what's your second pick? Well, seeing as Vanguard is technically a post-World War II ship, this is actually quite a difficult one. Um, choices would include the cruiser HMS Norfolk, uh, the battleship HMS Rodney, but I think ultimately, uh, since Ark Royal ended up sunk, the, I would almost certainly have to go with HMS Renown because she's a really nice ship to look at. Um, she's plenty big enough. She's got a really long history, uh, almost as long as War Spites. And uh, she saw some quite notable actions in World War II as well. And, well, I, I, I think I haven't met anyone who doesn't like the look of Refit Renown. I mean, there are some people who are okay with her rather than enthusiastic, but she's a really, really good looking ship as well. Admiralty of Floof asks, what's behind the barbettes? What does it look like in there? Is there individual small rooms, one large long corridor with guns every so often, a central ammunition hoist, one for every gun, etc.? Well, it varies quite considerably. So here we are in the shell room of HMS Belfast, but in what I can now say is my relatively wide experience of climbing inside various museum ships barbettes, which is not a phrase I thought I would be able to say anytime soon a few years ago. As I say, it is hugely varied. So in Belfast, if you look up from the shell room, you're looking up inside the barbette. There's basically just the shell hoists and a platform, which you can just about see in the top of the video at this point, and not a lot else. There's just kind of this big tube and then you can see the floor of the turret above you. Whereas in other ships, like, uh, say, Texas, there is an awful lot of machinery um, and handling rooms and so forth in between the magazines going up through the barbettes to the gun house itself, aka, AKA the turret. So it's hugely, hugely varied depending on the size of ship and the age of of the ship and it gets more complex and less complex also depending on the type of ship so yeah maybe that is something for a wednesday video at some point miles mccaskill asks what happens inside a ship's compartment when its steam is released well the, it depends on a number of variables where is the steam coming from what is the original pressure in the machinery and how large is the compartment being some of them plus also what's the size of the breach because you know, if you breach a US or German steam plant, and let's say they're operating about 600 PSI, that's going to be a very different story to if you breach a, let's say, a Royal Navy steam plant that's operating at 300 to 350 PSI. I mean, it's not going to be good in either case, but it's going to be dramatically worse in the higher pressure cases. Or And then you've got the fact of, well, have you breached one of the 600 or 350 PSI steam lines or have you breached one of the lower pressure steam lines um, and then as i said how large is the breach if it's a pin prick breach then that's one thing if the pipe has just been sheared in half or there's a hole in the boiler that's a very different thing 
And then that also obviously then goes into size of compartment because obviously the machinery spaces are where you're most likely to get a steam line being breached or a boiler being breached because that's where the boilers tend to be. Uh, but you can also get relatively high pressure steam lines in other portions of the ship or in small compartments within the overall engineering space. And that is obviously going to be a much bigger problem than in a much wider space. But if we're assuming a relatively sort of, well, not mid-scale, but not immediately catastrophic, I, we haven't had a boiler explosion, because that's a separate issue entirely, but let's say there's a 600 PSI steam line and it's been severed. What's going to happen? Um, anyone in the immediate radius is probably dead, because whatever force breached that is probably has probably killed them. If it hasn't, then the shrapnel that's probably going to result from the pipe breaching or being bits of it being thrown around is probably going to kill them. And if that doesn't kill them, they're going to wish it had because the next thing that's going to hit them is an awful lot of incredibly hot, incredibly high pressure superheated steam. And that definitely will kill them in very, very unpleasant ways that are unsafe to even describe on YouTube. Now, how bad it gets for the rest of the compartment depends quite a lot on how much steam is there left in that section of the system because of course you can seal off that section or it might have automatic seals in the case of uh, significant pressure drop again depending on the age of the machinery etc etc but uh, well you're going to end up with a very very rapid increase in temperature and pressure going on in the compartment where this uh, steam is escaping and especially in machinery spaces which tend to be to a certain degree pressure sealed to in, in have a positive pressure to the boilers uh, that's probably going to get very oppressive very quickly uh, but you know there are vents and stuff that might be overloaded and blown backwards but if you have a very 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 major steam leak like that normally you'd want to get everyone out there as quickly as possible as i said if it's a smaller breach you would send people in to try and isolate or repair or seal it off uh, but if you're talking about you know um, it, let's say an entire boiler's worth of steam production being dumped through a several inch wide pipe into the machinery space people are going to have to get out there sharpish um, in terms of how much time you need be, want to re-enter the compartment once either somebody or something has sealed off the leak or it, the pressure has just run out Weirdly enough, again, well, again, it depends on the size of the compartment, but also the fittings, because, of course, engineering spaces have plenty of vents and blowers. So once the actual generation of the high pressure expanding steam has gone away, then the, the vents and blowers in the machinery space are probably actually going to relatively quickly evacuate enough of it to let people back in of course there's still going to be huge amounts of con of extremely hot uh, condensate water uh, which are going to make things difficult and a lot of the metal work is probably going to be very hot but there are ways of coping with that whereas a breach in another compartment where there isn't quite as much active ventilation might take a lot longer to actually deal with um, what kind of secondary damage could be done to other mechanical and electrical systems as a result of exposure to the steam well, electrical systems will probably very, very easily be shorted out. Um, the temperatures, except for in the immediate localized area of the steam breach, probably won't affect you know, the, the electrical systems that much. I mean, you're not going to be melting solder or you know, distorting and warping electrical panels at 200 yards or something like that. Unless, of course, yeah, again, it's a boiler dump or something like that. Um, mechanical systems again most of the mechanical systems down in a machinery space are either already hilariously well insulated and or made of massive slabs of metal so again a, a rapid peak in temperature in the local environment probably isn't going to do too much long-term damage to them again unless it's a massive like boiler scale breach in which case it's probably more the force of the steam escaping than the heat that's going to do the damage but the heat could also do a certain degree of damage but um, yeah, humans tend to be more fragile than large scale machinery for the most part, which is why they tend to, tend to evacuate. But as anybody who's uh, down in the comments who's ever worked with high pressure <laughs> steam machinery will be able to say, any 
steam leak is exceptionally bad and a hazard to life it's just what radius is that hazard in um, and that scales on the size of the leak christopher dent asks can you help me better understand how the major naval belligerents the kriegsmarino um, Regia Marina, Royal Navy, Imperial Japanese Navy, and U.S. Navy employed capital ship-based float planes during World War II. Were there meaningful differences between them? There were, um, although initially, in theory, there shouldn't have been. Um, in theory, the vast majority of scout planes or float planes mounted aboard capital ships in the run-up to World War II were supposed to be there primarily for gunnery spotting. They could do other things, you know. Uh, a lot of them obviously were just common float planes found across the fleet. So that's not to say that they weren't able to do scouting and all other sorts of duties. But generally speaking, it was held that if you were going to do scouting, that scouting was either best left to aircraft carriers or cruisers depending on the navy in question um, if you had to rely on your capital ships float planes for scouting then you could do but ideally not so ideally you would want to be using them for as i said for gunnery spotting and other battle related activities the exception to that was the kriegsmarine which did have that role in mind um, but also had the idea of using them much more in the recon role to go and find targets to shoot at, which the other navies tended to, as I said, because mostly they were larger, tended to uh, devolve to other smaller vessels or dedicated aircraft carriers. Generally speaking, the float planes that you would find on capital ships were two-man aircraft. Um, there were a few three-man aircraft but they tended not to be very common um the japanese had a fairly widespread three-man float plane but most of their capital ships carried two-man float planes the royal navy was a bit unusual in that a number of its capital ships and any cruisers carried the ship the uh, aircraft you can see in front of you now the walrus which was actually a four-man aircraft and substantially larger than average but some of their other capital ships like Warspite carried something like, say, a float plane swordfish, which, to be fair, is still actually a three man aircraft. So, the Royal Navy generally deployed slightly larger float planes than most. They would still be used for fire control, direct, and gunnery spotting occasionally. So, Massachusetts aircraft served this function at Casablanca and uh, some of the Italian aircraft directed the fire of Littorio class battleships during various encounters in the Mediterranean. The British also would do it, but despite this being a specific role, and the Japanese, as well as a few others, would also use them to drop flares to, so, you know, go, the enemy's over here, guys. You generally tended to find battleship float planes either weren't used or when they were used, they tended to be used in slightly more odd roles, um, such as reconnaissance over land. Um, shore bombardment spotting was a thing that a lot of US battleship float planes ended up doing. Air sea rescue, um, especially things like the walrus, which, as you can tell, being a flying boat was a technically a little bit more suited to the role and had the capacity for it. And also communications and personnel deliveries for high-ranking personnel. Um, that also could be a thing that these aircraft were used for. So they actually ended up being used for far more roles than Doctrine said they should be. Uh, broadly speaking, and this is very broad, if you want to look at those various navies, the Arado 196s of the Kriegsmarine tended to be used a little bit more than average for long-range aerial reconnaissance to try and find targets. Uh, the Regia Marina probably stuck the closest to Doctrine. Um, a lot of spotting, immediate short-range recon, flare dropping, that kind of thing. Uh, the Royal Navy had a really huge variety of uses, as I've mostly intimated already, and of course you have things like uh, War Spite's Swordfish float plane actually doing a, a brief stint as an anti-submarine bomber, in the third battle of Narvik 
as well as also being a full-on recon aircraft as it headed up that way. The Japanese Navy, you know, flare dropping, not so much the gunfire support role, although there wasn't really a huge amount of gunfire conducted by Japanese capital ships at points where the aircraft spotting would have been useful anyway. Um, but lots of nighttime reconnaissance and so forth. And the US Navy, again, as mentioned, uh, a lot of shore-based fire support as in you know, helping the battleships fire on the shore but uh, in all cases especially u.s japanese and royal navy cases um, a lot of dogs body work transporting people to and from and occasionally rescuing people as well the wind thief asks during the dreadnought era at what ranges could a ship reasonably spot another ship and how much of an impact did the mounting height of rangefinding equipment have on this? For instance, could a battleship spot an incoming destroyer and take action before being seen itself? Assume that neither ship involved has radar. I mean, in theory, assuming a nice, calm, clear day, the spotting distance is a bit over the horizon for any ship in question. Exactly how far over the horizon depends on what ship you're spotting and, as you mentioned, how high up your optical equipment is. I mean, technically speaking, the Mark I human eyeball or someone with a pair of binoculars mounted really high up in the ship could spot something that's a bit over the horizon anyway, but having the powerful optics of your rangefinders could help with that quite a lot. Now, the reason I say over the horizon rather than at the horizon is that because ships do have a vertical element to them. So on the horizon, you could spot the entirety of a ship. Over the horizon, as the ship goes further around the curve of the Earth, the ship will appear to gradually sink out of sight. But, as you can see here with uh, HMS Emperor of India, it would be entirely possible and plausible to expect to see the fire control tops or the masts well before the rest of the ship came into view. So, you know, from HMS Dreadnought onwards, spotting at that distance is mainly going to be affected more by the weather conditions, you know, haze, shimmer, etc., etc., rather than a physical inability to see that far. Now, with that being said... The other factor you, that you asked is, you know, could a battleship spot a destroyer and take action before itself being seen? Well, generally speaking, the larger ship is easier to see than the smaller vessel, but the absolute range at which a battleship can spot things is usually going to be more because the mast is higher, therefore people up top can see further. The flip side, of course, is that anything to do with line of sight if you can see them, they can, in theory, see you. And a destroyer is going to be much smaller and therefore harder to spot than the battleship. Now, granted, that does mean a destroyer is going to be spotted at closer range than a, another battleship would be. But, of course, with the destroyer having the lower mast height, it also means the destroyer is going to spot things at a closer range, so it all evens out. So basically it comes down to skill of the crew and the prevailing weather and light conditions. Is it possible for a battleship to spot a destroyer and take action before the battleship is seen? Yes, if the destroyer's crew aren't particularly on the lookout and the battleship's crew are, or if, say, it's, I don't know, about four o'clock in the afternoon on an average day and the sun is behind relatively speaking, the battleship and shining towards the eyes of the destroyer crew, they're going to have trouble making out what's on the distant horizon. The battleship crew, on the other hand, will have everything nicely lit up for them, um, and so on and so forth. So it's possible, but in most circumstances, without an inherent weather advantage one way or the other, it's more likely the destroyer is going to see the battleship first. J Mace asks... I saw a First World War documentary around age five, and I noticed whenever the cannons fire, they seem to automatically drop, and I assume the shock of the gun firing caused the mechanism that held the gun up to lose hold, and therefore the gun dropped, but I've also noticed that on land, some cannons stay raised once fired, and I'm wondering, are gun training systems designed to lower the gun automatically, or is this done manually, or is it the shock of the gun firing? 
this is normally an automatic function of the guns because in pretty much every battleship's case even the ones that were technically designed with all aspect loading it didn't usually tend to work out very well um but yeah generally in pretty much all battleships cases the guns have to return to level or near level in order to be reloaded and since getting a reasonably decent rate of fire is in the best interest of everybody aboard the ship the guns were designed so that yeah they would be held at a specific angle for actually you know firing them at the target in question but once that firing had been achieved they would be lowered down um, by the hydraulic or other systems depending on what the turret was using to their loading angle so that they could rapidly be reloaded again because there was no point in trying to make that a manual only process because while well, the gun's just gone through a firing cycle it's that's a fairly violent action you don't want people you know standing as close as humanly possible to it when that's occurring if you can avoid it and it, it it's much there better therefore for the gun to just automatically head on its way to zero degrees five degrees or whatever uh, now you can set the guns to stay pointing up if you want to for whatever reason um but that's basically for kind of pr purposes and so forth it doesn't serve any useful combat function um with the exception potentially of if you are firing some guns from a specific turret in those cases you might wants to keep the other guns elevated purely just to keep the precise balance of the turret at a particular point which makes it easier for the subsequent firings to be a little bit more accurate but even then even with you know single gun firings or two out of three firing quite often the guns will just return to loading position or to, anyway Ger Variola asks why were there never battleship main guns longer than 50 calibers in tanks 70 caliber guns provided quite remarkable penetration figures compared to guns with higher calibers but less length such as the panther's 7.5 centimeter l70 compared to the tiger's 88 millimeter l56 what caliber would an l70 gun need to achieve similar penetration figures at usual combat ranges as compared to the Iowa's 16-inch 50s or the Yamato's 18.1-inch 45s. Uh, well, actually, Jingles... Wait, 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 no! Um, in all seriousness, um, there were a few battleship guns a little bit beyond 50 caliber, but to be fair, they were 52 caliber, so the general gist of your point stands. Um, the Soviets did plan a few somewhat longer barreled guns but they never actually got them deployed because they never actually built the ships in question but when it comes to battleship guns there are a number of issues with putting them up to 70 caliber uh, one of which is just the sheer size of the guns so if you look at battleship guns cruiser guns etc there are issues with barrel droop over prolonged periods of firing as they heat up the longer the barrel the more that barrel droop is going to be a problem um, there's also manufacturing issues can you actually manufacture something of that size because to be fair you know a 75 millimeter gun at 70 calibers long is nowhere near as long as a 16 inch gun that's 70 calibers long so the you know the precision of manufacturing for something that large is just going to be insane plus there's propellant pressures to consider the barrel length is in large part dictated by how much useful work you can get out of the expanding ball of gas caused by the ignition of the propellants and at a certain point that rate of expansion is going to start to slow which is actually going to slow down the shell so you know you can't make an infinitely long gun and just expect it to be continuously expanding uh, that's one of the reasons why you see sort of 25 30 35 caliber length weapons in the latter part of the 19th century and then there's this jump to 40 and 45 caliber weapons because of improved propellants with different burn rates and related to that there's also the effect of recoil because again things don't necessarily scale proportionally the time it takes a shell to accelerate down a 70 caliber length barrel on a 75 millimeter gun 
you know, there's a certain amount of acceleration, a certain amount of physical distance to cover. If you scale up to a 16 inch gun and you make it 70 calibers long, the distance it's the shell has to travel is considerably more. Therefore, obviously the acceleration is going to be slightly different, but the time involved to get from breech to muzzle is going to be significantly increased, at which point the effects of vibration, shock, recoil, etc. on the gun barrel are going to be definitely a thing. There's also the matter of balancing the gun for the turret and for the ship, which could present some rather serious issues. Plus there's the sheer inertia and bending moments that would be exerted. So, for example, if you look at an Iowa class's 16-inch uh, 50 gun. Now, this is going to be a very crude analysis because, of course, a gun is not a uniform cylinder. It is somewhat thicker towards the base. But if you average it out, the 16-inch 50 caliber gun, not including the breech, weighs just over 108 tons. Now, if you divide that through by the length of the gun's bore, which is 800 inches, because that's 16 multiplied by 50, there's another 16 inches of gun at the back where the breech sits in, but we'll ignore that for the minute. Um, that gives you a average weight per inch slice of the gun of 135 kilos, which means that every foot of the gun weighs 1.62 tons. Now, we know where the mounting point for the guns on the Iowa class is. There's 50 foot of barrel past the uh, mounting point, the point of rotation, and there's another 18 foot behind it. So looking at the point of rotation and then adding our 1.62 in the middle of the last foot, which so 49 and a half feet away from the point of rotation... And so that means that that last one foot of gun barrel on an Iowa class's gun is exerting a force of 180,000 foot-pounds, give or take a little bit, at the point of rotation. Now, if we extend the gun by another 20 calibers, and then we look at, okay, how much uh, force is that last one foot of gun barrel exerting on the point of rotation now now obviously this is again a very crude analysis because we haven't factored in exactly where the point of rotation is going to move because it would have to move because there's a lot more steel on the on one end now but again just for approximate values you're looking at now that same one foot of steel is now exerting a force of 275,000 foot pounds on the point of rotation and that's just the last foot. So, and we're adding 26 ish, 26 and a bit feet to the gun barrel. So, all of that extra force, so it's not just the weight, but the increased uh, bending moment. It would be questionable if a gun of that length at that scale could actually support itself, especially given the forces that will be acted on it when it's at sea, you know, with the ship bouncing around all over the place. Unfortunately, when it comes to what caliber would you need to have a 70, uh, would you have to have a 70 caliber length gun at to get similar penetration figures to an Iowa? Um, I don't know offhand because every gun's performance is different. Um, I mean, you know, you have a variety of approximately 50 caliber 15 inch guns, uh, Bismarck and the Torio, for instance, but they have radically different performance figures. So it, even charting different 15-inch guns, which might seem to be the easiest because you've got 15-inch 42, 15-inch 45, 15-inch 50, 15-inch 52, um, getting a linear or logarithmic or whatever other form of scale for you know same caliber in terms of uh, shell width, but different lengths, even with the 12-inch guns, where you can go from 12-inch 30 all the way up to 12-inch 52, it's it, it, doing that kind of calculation is going to be very very complex um and I, i'm not in a position to be able to work that out particularly easily you'd also have to deal with range as well because you'd be getting a very very high velocity weapon um, but obviously it's going to be a smaller lighter shell so you're going to have fall off over distance which is going to be different in profile to the super heavy shells of the 16 inch or just the big heavy shells of the 18 inch David Carlson asks, Over time, many ships have had interesting or colourful careers. If you could interview or work with incarnations of ships, are there any that you think would be particularly interesting, hilarious, or terrible to talk to, 
or have to work with. Without addressing relative qualities of any specific ship girl media properties, it does seem like if ships were being semi-randomly incarnated as people, the ships you got might not align well with the ships you want. Well, I mean, it's how they are incarnated as people would be the interesting thing. I mean, if they took on characteristics of the ships based on their nationality, like age determined by length of service, um, and so on and so forth, some of them would be absolutely hilarious to work with. I mean, I can quite easily imagine War Spike, given how long she was in service, how much action she saw, how many times she ended up with damage in various ways, shapes and forms, um, especially later on with like Fritz X's and mines and so forth. I can very easily see War Spite as, and also actually relative size compared to some of the later ships, you know, War Spite to my mind would be, um, and I know this is reaching because the statistical likelihood of anybody listening who has also been in Sutton Grammar School in the south of London in the 90s and early 2000s is and was also listening to this particular um uh video is very very unlikely but if you are out there um if anyone remembers dr wrench the good old chemistry teacher that i had in high school you know you'll get where i'm coming from but i can imagine war spite as kind of this like five foot two old lady covered in battle scars um sitting there quietly um, with an absolutely sort of massive amount of stories to tell, um, but not really tolerating fools easily. <laughs> you know, kind of yes. What do you want? <laughs> you know, I, I've I've seen a lot of stuff. Come on, get on with it. <laughs> um, it's like slightly cantankerous, but also um, very very knowledgeable. Whereas you know something like say Laffy. Um, if you if you're counting years in active service um, or, or maybe overall age, like Laffy would be kind of the uh, slightly slightly gimlet eyed, like late teens, early twenties, who just spends their entire time on a gun range, like you know, dual wielding Tommy guns for the fun of it, that kind of thing. Victory and Constitution, um, I kind of imagine as two extremely old kind of Merlin Gandalf Dumbledore style figures um, just sitting back on their recliners like when I were a lad things were much better and kind of glaring at each other like why won't you die first <laughs> but looking at all the other younger younger ships walking around just like ah uh, they don't know whatever it's like back in the day <laughs> with the number of times the Iowas were dragged in and out of service um i can imagine something like uss new jersey not being obviously quite as old as war Spite. i mean yes i know theoretically new jersey is actually now much older than war Spite at the time war Spite was broken up but you know in terms of ongoing active service career you know something like new jersey would be someone in their like mid 60s early 70s um and you know because they're called, was being called back in service they're just kind of sitting there with an expectant look on their face and then as soon as they hear a bell or a phone call, they just reach into the gun lock. It's like, oh boy, here I go killing again. <laughs> and then you've got something like, say, Texas, which, again, relatively older person. But, you know, with the number of modifications, refits, upgrades, repairs and patches Texas has had, that you know, that would be the kind of person who's like, well, you know, uh, I've got two artificial knees, an artificial hip. My lower leg is completely uh, bionic. I've got a cyborg arm, <laughs> this kind of thing, but also rather relishing it. So yeah, I think there would be quite a lot of ships if they were incarnated as people that accurately reflected their service lives that would be very interesting to talk to. Burnt Potato asks, Suppose Jackie Fisher could not convince Parliament to get rid of the miser's hoard of useless junk because of politics, but he did manage to instigate the Dreadnought Revolution. What does the British fleet look like at the start of war in 1914? Assuming the money and personnel from scrapping the fleet would not be forthcoming until summer 1914 and the Germans would feel less pressure to build from the arms race. So I think in some ways you have to look towards the US Navy to get an idea of what would be dropped and what wouldn't be. And as a result, I think the battle fleet would probably look pretty similar because capital ships at that point are seen as the ultimate arbiters of power. 
Uh, cruisers are very important for the British because, of course, you need them for fleet scouting and for overseas commerce protection. But, you know, when you look at what the US Navy did when it was very cash strapped, the first thing they said is, right, well, we're not going to build destroyers because they're cheap. We can build them really quickly um, if we need to. But although they're individually cheap, building them in numbers is expensive. So as I said, don't build them now. Wait until you get to the point where you need them. Then you can churn them out fast. Then the cruisers are sacrificed. And it's only at the very end that the battleships are sacrificed. Initially, my first thought was maybe Fisher would drop the battle cruisers because they're expensive. But then looking at the comparative costs, I realized actually Fisher will probably push the battle cruisers even harder as an economy measure, if you can believe it. Because the Minotaur class, the last generation of British armored cruisers, cost just over 1.4 million. And depending on which figures you believe, the Invincible class cost around 1.6 to 1.7 million. So Fisher can point to that and go, well, you know, if we build armoured cruisers to protect our commerce and destroy enemy commerce raiders, we're going to need to build lots of them. And, you know, or I can build this new fancy battle cruiser for only 15 to 20 percent more money and you need far fewer of them and they obsolete everybody else's ships. Therefore, it's actually economical to build three battle cruisers in a given year as opposed to having to build six armored cruisers or something like that so what will probably happen as i said is the destroyer flotillas will get cut down quite significantly um the things like the scout cruisers will probably be removed entirely from the program the town class will probably still be around but in much less numbers and uh also if you're not able to get rid of the really old useless stuff um fisher might also then try and get rid of some of the slightly newer uh, useless stuff so some of the first armored cruisers some of the early protected cruisers etc stuff that was still technically on the front line even in 1914 um he might try and ditch that because they're small they're not particularly useful and if he's forced to maintain the bigger older ironclads and so forth well these smaller less useful ships are the kind of ships you can churn out in mass numbers uh, when the need arises graham william kidd asks i'm reading royal navy torpedo bombers versus axis warships 1939 to 45 by matthew willis in it he regularly mentions the anglo-german naval agreement of 1935 this one is new to me and apparently it retrospectively legalized the twins could you take us through this agreement? What it was, how it came about, was it observed, and how could there be a two-sided agreement in the era of the Washington and London Naval Treaties? So there's probably a whole Wednesday video in and of itself in that, but briefly, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935 was exactly what it says on the tin. It was a treaty that was signed between Britain and Germany, and it basically gave Germany permission to build up to 35% of the tonnage of the Royal Navy and that was encapsulated as 35% of total tonnage with a recognized principle that in the individual ship categories it should be 35% in each category but uh, section 2 part d of the treaty also bound Germany to specific regulations on maximum tonnage of ship and maximum caliber of armament on particular vessels as per the existing naval treaties at that point that being the London Naval Treaty of 1930 that's something you see some people who are somewhat ill-informed deny occasionally when people when you say oh Bismarck is a treaty breaking battle people are like ah oh, well the Anglo Naval German uh, Anglo German Naval Treaty doesn't actually mean that Germany has to follow the treaty restrictions on battleship yes actually it does you know, go and read two part d it, it's not quite as explicit as the washington and london naval treaties but it does actually commit germany to building for example with battleships at that point bearing in mind the london naval treaty the second london naval treaty at that point hadn't yet been signed it commits germany to thirty-five thousand tons and 16 inches for their battleships uh, obviously germany uh, would theoretically under the terms of the Anglo-German Naval Treaty, be forced to build 35,000 tons and 14 inches after the signature of Second London. Um, but any ship that was designed or started before that wouldn't be bound by that, hence why you get the Richelieu's. Well, and also the fact that the French didn't really sign up to all of Second London anyway. And this is further proved by the fact that they actually 
are very specific in that in two part D and in other parts of the treaty that if Germany builds to 35% as a guideline, then with the tonnage restrictions that are in place, it may not be possible to get exactly spot on 35%. For example, British battleship tonnage carried over from the Washington Treaty was 525,000 tons. 35% of that was 183,750 tons. And if you divided that through by 35,000 tons, that gave you 5.25 battleships. Now, obviously, Germany wasn't going to be able to build a quarter of a battleship, and so the agreement had things in place to say, OK, well, in that case, we'll build effectively what it was saying. was, well, We can build five battleships, but then that 25 percent of 35,000 tons we can allocate to you know another element of the our building. So cruisers or destroyers, for example, if you know, slap a little bit onto there, we might get an extra cruiser out of it or something like that. Uh, it also specifically contained a uh clause to build up to 45 percent of royal navy displacement in u-boats and view other details which are relatively interesting but in terms of was it observed and why it well how it came about why it was observed um it came about basically because germany was already in the process of violating the versailles restrictions there were some minor violations that had occurred during the 1920s under the weimar government but with hitler in power Germany was blatantly violating the Versailles Treaty, such as building U-boats when the Versailles Treaty said you couldn't have them. And the British government took the view of, well, if we maybe give them something that's a little bit more reasonable, then perhaps they will stick to that rather than if we just continue to insist on what's now blatantly an unenforceable Versailles Treaty then they might just go off and do something really reckless like restart the Anglo-German naval race. So it was kind of a damage control mitigation process. In terms of was it observed, initially, yes, but only for a few years because Hitler repudiated it about four years after it was signed. So, you know, not for too long. And of course, that was in principle. You have things like the Hipper class, which are blatantly treaty breaking in both terms of both being treaty breakers for the general naval agreements and treaty breakers for the uh, anglo-german naval agreement because as i said two party says that they will stick to in this case ten thousand ton cruisers now as far as how could there be an arbitrary two-sided agreement when you've got the washington and london naval treaties going on well remember germany wasn't part of the washington or london naval treaties so technically there's nothing in them that prevents Britain from signing a separate treaty with Germany to regulate its fleet. Um, Germany could theoretically be brought on board in future naval treaties, but you know the, there's nothing that says the two broad, the broader and the specific can't stand side by side. The much bigger issue was the fact that you also had Italy and France who had signed the Versailles Treaty, and you know, France especially was very, very determined to keep Germany down as much as humanly possible and so France was uh, less than happy when Britain turned around and said oh yeah by the way that that part of the Versailles Treaty the part that we all signed together uh, the part that we probably should have consulted you and got you in on when we changed it arbitrarily well guess what we changed it arbitrarily and now you're going to have to live with it but in a classic example of you know the strong do what they want and the weak suffer what they must um, France was not in a position at that stage to do much more than make angry noises at Britain and you know be very irritated about the thing but wasn't in much of a position to actually do anything about it because the only things that France had in its arsenal at that point which it could conceivably have done would either be to go over to Germany and say well actually we're still enforcing the Versailles Treaty in its original form and therefore don't build these things or we'll come and blow stuff up which they weren't really in a position to do at that stage or even worse you know pick a fight with Britain to try and get them to enforce the Versailles Treaty properly which again they weren't in a position to do and the Americans broadly didn't seem to care all that much. Federico Bozzi asks what did official Royal Navy records say about the accuracy or lack of it from Vittorio Veneto and Littorio at uh, Spartivento and First Certe, etc.? 
Now, I do have to apologise for this because I think this was a question from several months ago, but it's taken a while for me to gather the relevant data because, well, the records, action reports, deck logs, etc., they take a while to go through because there's a lot of ships involved. But generally speaking, the theme that comes through is, you know, pretty much as I've mentioned in other videos about the Italian Navy, there's nothing wrong with the Italian range finding. They are perfectly capable of getting the range almost pretty much spot on, but they then fail to capitalise on having got the range very accurately very quickly because of the overall inaccuracy of the gun. So, for example, um, it, when, it, uh, when they're talking about the Battle of Spartivento, uh, you have fra uh, phrases such as, uh, the enemy's fire was accurate, particularly in the early stages, but his rate of fire was extremely slow, and when he was fully engaged, his spread became ragged and his accuracy deteriorated rapidly. You also have accounts from the individuals aboard the various ships that are recorded in the various ships' action reports, um, such as uh, aboard cruisers, uh, even cruisers that came under direct attack and perhaps had some splinter damage, where you have sailors talking about... Uh, the fact that they were under fire from an Italian battleship for sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes, but they described the situation as them coming out very well drenched, but miraculously unscathed. Uh, that's a direct quote. Another quote is that it seemed he was targeting us, that being an Italian battleship, but it was difficult to discern after a while as great water spouts rose fore and aft of us, many closer to the other cruisers in our line than we ourselves. And yet another quote being, they pounded the sea all around us, but fortunately, or by the grace of God, did not land a hit directly. So via these and various other uh, quotations that I could relate, but it would go on for a little while. Essentially, the, the general consensus, as I mentioned at the beginning, seems to be that the Royal Navy thought that the Italians were very, very good at finding the range, but either through spectacular bad luck or some other degradation in their gunnery the actual accuracy of the spread of shells was pretty bad to the extent that yet no royal navy ship was actually hit directly by a 15 inch shell or a 12.6 inch or whatever they bought out the uh, duilios and cavors to um, at any stage although some splinter damage was taken from near misses so you know there a few shells did land close enough but considering the sheer volume of shells that were thrown out and no hits obtained, you know, they they were noticing this as a consistent factor. And semi-separate to this, it was also noted that it would be perhaps inadvisable for the light cruisers to close in on their Italian cruiser counterparts, Italians usually using heavy cruisers, because obviously the British don't know exactly why the Italians shells aren't quite landing, but there is considerable thought given in a number of reports to the fact that perhaps closing the distance would allow the Italians to group up or tighten up their salvos, which given that they were obviously very good at finding the range might result in a number of hits being scored fairly quickly. And in part, I suspect this may be what dictates a lot of Royal Navy cruiser behaviour in various actions with the Italians after the first few, where you have light cruisers and heavy cruisers which theoretically can engage each other, but the British ships, unless they've already got a significant range advantage, i.e. that they're fairly close, they otherwise tend to drop smoke and try and lure the Italians in closer, with obviously the smoke obscuring the Italians' ability to see them, or they fall back on larger ships, which can in turn outrange the Italian cruisers, because they know that the Italians already have their range, and so their thinking goes, well, if we close in, we're more likely to get hit, and we don't necessarily have the range immediately, which is you know a fairly decent compliment to the Italian rangefinder techniques, if not necessarily to the accuracy of their guns. Peter Guy asks, is there a reliable source for losses by the Japanese Navy at the expense of US aircraft, submarines and surface ships? I know the US submarine fleet decimated the Japanese merchant fleet, but do we know what was the cause of the largest proportion of Japanese warship losses, whether by number or by tonnage? I'm guessing carrier aircraft are probably up there, but I'd love to know if there are any statistics showing otherwise. Well, there are a number of different source indications. Um, 
and you know, they vary in reliability. There is, of course, the JANAC, or Joint Army Navy Assessment Committee, which was formed in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And in 1947, it issued a report, Japanese Naval and Merchant Shipping Losses During World War II by All Causes, which resulted in this graph here. So you can see that in terms of naval losses, carrier aircraft were the single largest cause of Japanese naval losses. Whereas in terms of merchant marine losses, submarines have quite the extensive lead, in, at least in terms of tonnage. Now, of course, JANAC figures can and have been disputed, um, you know, specifically what killed what ship or how many ships were killed by which submarine and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't necessarily say these are absolutely perfect spot on figures, but if you want a rough guide as to, you know, which form of attack sunk the most ships, it's probably not going to deviate massively from this graph. So, for, you know, for example, the carrier aircraft are still going to be the single biggest killers of Japanese warships. The subs are still going to be the single biggest killers of Japanese merchant ships and so on. Um, it's just exact details of who killed what might vary a bit. And if you search for Japanese naval and merchant shipping losses during World War II by all causes, um, either generically or specifically on the Naval History and Heritage Command website, they've actually got a digitized version of the entire report, which has all sorts of fun and interesting tables where it divides things up. Uh, you know, naval and merchant vessels sunk both by number and by tonnage by the various um, forces so u.s forces allied forces then it breaks down the various allied forces then combinations of u.s and allied forces um, there's also loss rates where the japanese ships have hit their own mines uh, 21 merchant ships apparently did that some unknowns and then there's another table which again is number and tonnage naval and merchant but then divides up by the sinking agent rather than the uh, nation in question, so number sunk by submarines, number sunk by surface craft, sunk by navy aircraft, etc., etc. Um, and then there's further breakdowns of you know what number of ships sunk by British ships, and then by submarine aircraft, etc. So for example, Janak credits 14 Japanese warships have been being sunk, sunk by British submarines, eight by surface craft, two by navy. Navy land-based aircraft, one by army aircraft, so um, I think that's basically, that's the RAF, because that's how they classify things, and then three by mines, um, and then you've got you know, similar ones for the US forces, and then there is a chronological listing, as far as they can tell, of every single Japanese vessel that's been sunk during World War II, um, which includes the name of the vessel, the type, its tonnage, the approximate location, um, who sank it in terms of what nation sank it, um, how it was sunk, and the assessment, which is you know, universally going to be sunk, uh, unsurprisingly. So, for example, if you look on um, December, in December 1941, say on December the 11th, um, you have two destroyers listed as sunk by Navy shore batteries, that being the attack on, I presume, Wake Island. But that doesn't have the midget subs from Pearl Harbor. So this is why it's not an 100% accurate, because they didn't really know too much about those at the time. But, you know, you can keep going through. So you get down to, say, the sinking of Hiei. So it's listed as November 13th, 1942. Um, name of vessel Hiei, type of vessel battleship, standard tonnage 31,000 tons, location 9 degrees south, 159 degrees east. Flag of agent of sinking, United States. Type of agent of sinking, Army aircraft, Navy carrier-based aircraft, Navy land-based aircraft, Marine land-based aircraft, and surface craft. Assessment sunk. Um, so yeah, as, if you're looking for a sort of a broad base, then this is probably a pretty good one to go on. But there will be someone, I'm sure, will have tabulated things with very, very accurate assessments that include things like the Pearl Harbor midget subs and so forth. Uh, you do have to laugh at poor old Kirishima. She's just there as a, a line item. You know, Kirishima, battleship, 31,000 tons, 9 degrees, 10 minutes south, 159 degrees, 55 minutes east. Uh, United States craft, sunk her, type of agent, surface craft, aka USS Washington, assessment, sunk. Tyler Dunn asks, 
Why didn't the Germans develop naval infrastructure in East Prussia before the start of the war to avoid Allied bombing, given the rapidly increasing range of aircraft? Well, for one thing, it's uh, quite a task to build significant naval infrastructure. It would require years and years of investment and huge amounts of money, whereas they already have a bunch of um, naval infrastructure at places like Wilhelmshaven, so you know, given limited funds, use that, as opposed to expending the money that you could be spent spending on building warships, building it New, new naval infrastructure. Another thing is, over in East Prussia, there really isn't a suitable place to put new naval infrastructure. Um, the Poles have Gdynia, um, the or Danzig, or Gdansk, whatever you want to be calling it at any particular time. Um, the Germans, in theory, have Königsberg, which is now Kaliningrad, but the harbour there is insanely shallow. Um, you're not you basically, there has to be a, a very thin dredged channel to get out from the city itself to the open ocean. So there's nowhere really for naval ships to exist. Um, that there's just you know, there's no anchorage, safe anchorage or anything like that. Plus, all your manufacturing plant, your gun foundries, steelworks, etc., etc., they're all back in main the main part of Germany for the most part. And they tend to be near the resources. So if you build your naval infrastructure all the way over there, um, you've got to mine, extract, refine and manufacture all the various components, mostly in sort of the central part of Germany, where there are decent transport links. And then you've somehow got to get them all the way across. And bearing in mind, you have the Polish corridor by World War II, uh, which is what I'm assuming you're talking about, because um, bombing even a Wilhelmshaven is not really much finished in World War I. Um, you've got to get it across there, and Poland is relatively unlikely to allow that. And I mean, even if they did, you have a very long, very expensive transport route going, and if Poland's like, mm, well, we'd rather you didn't, then you've got to ship it all by sea, which is an additional expense, and then at the end of it all, you've got a bunch of ships which have basically have cost you significantly more to build, you don't really have anywhere to store over in that area, and they're now in the Baltic, which is not very useful to you, whether you're fighting Britain or France. So, realistically, it's better to just, as far as the Germans are concerned, spend a little bit more money on extra fighters and anti-aircraft guns to protect their existing infrastructure. Plus, it's not going to change all that much, because, yes, Kaliningrad dash Königsberg dash whatever yeah it is considerably further away than Wilhelmshaven but uh, the Wellington which you know it, it begins flight in the mid 1930s and you could consider to be a typical immediately pre-war British bomber that can still reach there and back its range with a you know 1500 2000 pound bomb load is still considerably further than the 700 odd miles it is from East Anglia to Königsberg. The Freaker 86 asks, I am looking for a good source for deck plans of the ships of the Admiral Hipper and Bismarck class, as well as deck plans for the Graf Spee. A web search I conducted gave no useful results. Do you have a good source where I can get them in good quality and preferably for free? Well, you're in luck. The dreadnoughtproject.org has some fairly detailed and high-res scan plans of the Prince Eugen. So that'll cover, well, at least one of the Admiral Hippers, considering they're all somewhat unique. Uh, for the Bismarck class, you're really in luck. If you search for Ger, i.e. Germany, G-E-R-Y-N-509, with spaces in between them all, KMS Bismarck Booklet of General Plans and you don't shoot me, that's what the actual title is, um, on archive.org, you will find the booklet of general plans for Bismarck, and that's scanned in extremely high resolution, and that'll give you the full set of deck plans for Bismarck, and some useful cross-sections as well. And you're in luck. On the same section of archive.org, under GERYN125 and 219, you will also find the general plans booklets for Deutschland and Graf Spee. So you can not only get the Deutschland class, but also see the difference between the first and last ships of that class. 
Um, sadly, on archive, they don't have the booklet of general plans for Admiral Hipper, at least as far as I can see. Fred the Red asks, What was the process of choosing a name for Royal Navy ships during the Age of Sail? Did someone simply draw a name out of the cool names we used before hat, or was it more complicated? And were there any restrictions on certain size ships not getting the big important names? There are some complexities to it, like at the time the Royal Navy tradition of naming the first big capital ship, usually a first rate, that it built in the reign of a new monarch after that monarch. Um, at the time, it wasn't as quite on the nose as, you know, HMS King George V, but it was things like Royal George or Royal James or Royal Anne, etc., etc. Um, they kind of transitioned over towards, you know, things like uh, Victoria in the 19th century but beyond that there was a kind of a selected pool of names for first rates um, but that pool of names was quite large obviously you had the various royal ship names and then things like victory which were re was reused for various first rates um, royal sovereign that kind of thing but when you're looking at second and third rates and so forth Usually it was just, you know, what's a name we've had before that we don't currently have now? Um, or is there a ship that's coming out of commission that we could reuse the name of? Is there a captured French ship we could reuse the name of? And if all else fails, then they'd look for kind of names adjacent to existing names to get vague themes going. Um, so Greek heroic names and so on and so forth. But unlike later years where you would see, for example, a class of ships would have names that either all begin with the same letter in the case of destroyers or would all run on a theme like the town class all named after British towns. Uh, the Arethuses and Leanders have various Greek names. Back in the Age of Sail, there wasn't really anything like that. For example, you've got the Intrepid class, uh, which was 64 gun third rates of the mid 1700s. And you'd think as an, an intrepid uh, class, you would have at least names associated with being intrepid. But no, you have intrepid, Monmouth, Defiance. Okay, Defiance, you could maybe associate vaguely qualitatively with it being intrepid. Nonsuch, Ruby, Vigilant, Eagle, America, um, Anson, Polyphemus, Magnanime, that's a French one. Um, well, that's named after a French captured vessel. Samson, Repulse, Diadem, and Standard. So there's not really any particular um, thought gone into a hot, uh, into a defining set of class distinctions. Um, and then you go a few few uh, classes later. You have the Inflexible class, which is Inflexible. Africa, relatively famous. Dictator and Scepter. Again, no particular coordinating theme. Down at a frigate level, you sometimes got a little bit more coherent with class names, but in any large run of frigates of a specific class, even then, you might have like 60-70% of the names having some form of general commonality and then random ones thrown in as well. About the only thing was that the names did need approving, so you couldn't just have shipyards coming up with random names for various vessels. That did have to go up to a fairly high authority, and for the biggest ships, the king had to, or queen, depending on the time period, had to personally sign off on them. Technically speaking, the monarch signs off on all the ship names, but when you get down to, like, sixth rates, they weren't really too fast. Camino John asks, Have you seen the new toroidal propeller technology? If so, what type of ship in World War II would have had the most benefit from this design? And for each ship of the major naval powers in World War II, if you could choose just one ship type, i.e. battleship, heavy cruiser, etc., which type would they pick to have this technology? Well, the two big selling points of the toroidal propeller when it comes to ships is that it's more fuel efficient and it's quieter. Now, there are some power increases for relative power as well but the, the two big selling points are fuel efficiency and, and sound at which point um, overall the escorts the anti-sub escorts would probably benefit the most from the toroidal propeller because they tend to be small so they can always use more fuel efficiency for longer range and the fact that they are quieter will make it easier for them to use their hydrophones and sonar 
to pick up enemy submarines, and it will also make it harder for enemy submarines to hear them going you know, the other way. I suppose, to a certain degree, also the submarines themselves would also benefit for similar reasons. They'd be able to go further, um, both underwater and on the surface, and they'd be harder to pick up on hydrophones. It doesn't do anything for their sonar profile, but the hydrophones dash what we later call passive sonar would have a hard time picking them up. Now, the disadvantage is that they are incredibly complex and difficult to produce relative to standard propellers. And so whilst for someone like Germany, producing them for subs would theoretically be the best of all the classes to produce them for. And as I said, almost in counter to that, producing them on submarine escorts would be the best use of them for the Allied powers. You'd make an argument maybe British battleships would need them because of the slight disadvantages of the short range that would, well, relatively speaking, short range that were uh, cropped up in uh, World War Two, Because of the expense and time and care that would be needed to make them, especially with World War Two era tech, I suspect if they were going to be produced at all, I think most of the major powers would probably end up putting them on their carriers and battleships and battle cruisers, purely because, well, a big capital ship set of propellers is going to cost a fortune anyway and relatively speaking you're not building that many of them um, so disregarding spares for a second if you build a let's say uh, four strong class of battleships like the South Dakotas or the Iowas well then you need to produce 12 propellers so 12 big expensive propellers plus a few spares and you now have a nice quiet fuel efficient even longer range battleship whereas if you produce 12 propellers for say destroyers well you can outfit six destroyers but you know, that's not even a single destroyer squadron or flotilla so you'd need to be producing a lot more propellers to outfit your destroyers or cruisers etc so on, on cost grounds i suspect it'll just be the big ships that would get them realistically JT Daily Update asks, did the Royal Navy ever create mock-up warships as recruiting tools or demonstrations to the public, such as USS Recruit in New York City during 1917 to 1920, and the battleship Illinois from the World's Columbian Expedition in 1893? As far as I'm aware, the Royal Navy didn't tend to go in for this sort of thing as an organised thing, um, largely on the basis of the fact, to be perfectly honest, that the vast, vast, vast majority of high-density population areas in the UK are either coastal or on major rivers, at which point during the period when you know the Royal Navy was doing a lot of recruiting, it was relatively easy to send a warship of some description and an appropriate size to the area if they really needed something to show off. So you, know, you can get anything up to... Uh, World War II era light cruiser into London quite easily. There's a few other things slightly larger you could probably get in there as well. Um, the Humber, the Mersey, etc., etc., um, and you know, Portsmouth, Plymouth, Edinburgh, Glasgow, all these other places. The Royal Navy would usually just go, well, we'll just send an actual warship. Um, it's one of the advantages of being on a relatively small island, whereas obviously in the US, especially around the time that these things were being mocked up a there were fewer u.s navy warships and b there was a lot more of the u.s and c an awful lot of the u.s is relatively landlocked in terms of can a warship get to us admittedly new york city is accessible by warship but then that comes back to the whole you know there's a limited number of ships we can actually show off in that period Mega Scrow asks, what is the crossover point between sail with auxiliary steam to steam with auxiliary sail I think that is spaced out over 10 to 15 years, maybe even up to 20, depending on the kind of ship you're looking at. So for, let's say, a battleship, ironclad as it was known at the time, I think the crossover point is probably somewhere around 1870-ish. Um, most ships prior to that that are steam powered are you know 
probably largely using sail with auxiliary steam in large part because of the limitations on range. Then immediately after the 1870 you get Devastation and Thunder over which prove you can have just steam and no sail. And then as you move through the 1870s you do ha still have some masted turret ships but and central battery ships but they're relying less and less on sail. So the crossover point where you go from primary sail to primary steam is probably 1870 for capital ships. But if you want to look at when does that crossover point occur for smaller ships, what we would now today call cruisers, but back then were called corvettes, you're probably looking at around 1880 or just after. Because, you know, in the early 1880s, they're still building long range cruisers or corvettes with full sail rigs because they're expected to spend long times at sea and therefore they're going to run under sail for quite a considerable time. Whereas by the mid 1880s, those same ships have now either significantly reduced or dropped the sails entirely to run entirely on steam with just the ability to hold some auxiliary sails to get them home in an emergency. So yeah, 1870-ish for the large ships and early 1880s for the smaller ones. John Plate asks, how big would chains have to be to stop a warship in the Age of Sail? For instance, a ship of the line, how big would a chain have to be to stop that? Surprisingly, not that large. Um, there, here are some links of what was called the Great Hudson River chain. Um, and as you can see, I mean, they're big for a chain on average, but they're not that massive. In fact, there are anchor chains that are considerably stronger than that. And that's actually a key thing, because if you think about it, an anchor chain has to be strong enough to hold a ship in position. So an anchor chain not attached to a ship, but strung across a entrance to a harbour would theoretically be strong enough to hold a ship in position against a fair amount of force. And because anchor chains have to hold ships in theory against, you know, the wind driving them hard, storm force winds and that kind of thing, they're actually a bit too strong to, uh, in terms of what's needed to hold back a ship. Because bear in mind, if you're going to make a chain across most harbours or rivers, that's going to be a very long chain. You've got to have some way of lifting it, so you don't want to make it too heavy um, if a lighter chain can do the job. Now, to be fair, you can break chains by running fairly heavily laden ships at them at high speed, and this does happen on a semi-regular basis back in historical times and indeed the this particular chain was thought to have been able to be breached if the British had run a ship at it that was fairly heavily loaded at a fair speed but again it's compromises you could make a sh chain that's completely impossible to break using uh, just a ship but then you there are other ways of doing it you know the fact that you may not be able to lift the chain into place if the chain is supported by buoys which being as heavy as it would be at that point you probably would have to do you can just go out and sink the buoys you can send people in boats to break the chain at night using various uh, direct methods again so yeah this is roughly what you would need for the average warship in the age of sail to be stopped if you were using an, a harbour chain um, a full-scale ship of the line, you probably need something maybe twice as thick. But if you're being rammed in the harbour by a full-scale ship of the line, you've probably got bigger things to worry about than whether or not your chain's going to hold. Lord Nelson asks, The British system of rating ships by the number of guns that they were pierced for is often used by modern naval historians as well. Wouldn't it be better to display the weight of the broadside instead, or additionally, since this way one could account for otherwise not counted carronades, the actual size of the guns mounted on the ship, uh, the difference between French livre and British pounds, etc., as used by different navies? I mean, in theory, having the weight of broadside as an additional would be useful, Um the, the, obviously, the British rating system, well, it was revised later on. So the classic rating system, as you mentioned, is by number of guns the ship is pierced for. And that was perfectly fine at the time that it was devised, because the number of guns the ship was pierced for was generally the number of guns it carried. And anything that wasn't big enough to have a hole pierced inside of the ship to mount was usually a swivel gun, some kind of anti-personnel gun, not really worth talking about in terms of anti-ship capability. But 
as carronades were developed and as ships got somewhat larger and they were able to just freely mount quarterdeck and forecastle chaser guns and so forth the ship's armament started creeping up a bit but because again it's not a pierced for gun it wasn't counted after the napoleonic wars they did realize this was getting a little bit silly because you had ships where like half their armament was made up of open deck carronades and it was then changed um but of course at that point the whole rating the ship by its number of, of, of gun system was relatively short-lived after that point because then you got into ironclads and uh, different ways of rating the capabilities of vessels so yeah with that little interesting anecdote aside displaying the weight of broadside i think would be would yeah it would be a useful bit of information however my only issue is that the number of guns a ship is pierced for doesn't really change so it gives you a broad idea of the ship's size and an approximate idea of what its capabilities are likely to be but the exact nature of a ship's armament does change usually during its career in the age of sail so you can find some royal navy first rates for example that had 42 pounders on the lower gun deck at first but the later had 32 pounders instead you have some that had 12 pounders on the upper deck and would later swap them for 18s or the other way around and you know all sorts of other things like that now granted you can get a slightly skewed idea of the exact combat capabilities of some ships because you do get some 74 gunners that have 24 pounder lower decks and the majority that have 32 pounder lower decks and all sorts of other things across the board and like you mentioned with the uh, french livres being slightly heavier than british pounds um but whilst it would be useful i think it would also lead to a huge amount of additional data in most quick reference systems because the thing is most of the time when you're mentioning the rating of guns on a number of sh on, on a ship you're getting an, an approximate idea of relative power so if you say right this is a 74 gun ship of the line whether it's armed with you know french 36 livres or british 32 pounders or whatever it's a still a 74 gunner it's going to be broadly in a category of combat capability so whether it's you know got the heavier shooting french guns or whether it's even you know one of the relatively small 74s that's actually got 24 pounder main armament you're not going to generally assess it as being capable of taking on a first rate ship of the line like a hundred gunner or more and equally a frigate whether it be a 32 gunner 38 gunner or 46 gunner is not really going to be in a shape to take on a 74 so as a, as a broad brush approach i think just the number of guns a ship is pierced for is a fairly easy way to get a, a, a ballpark of what they should be fighting and what they're outmatched against and what they massively overmatch but for very detailed ship comparisons as in could this specific ship beat this other specific ship all other things being equal then this kind of thing would be very very useful um with the, obviously then the caveat that for ships that change armament you've then got to specify also the time period within its career at which you want to make that assessment to make sure you've got the right armament and therefore the correct broadside weight um and I th the other thing i think is if you're going to go to that level of detail then you probably also need to quantify exactly what kind of guns are present because you could get something like the experimental british frigate that was fitted entirely with carronades or uss essex from the war of 1812 theoretically they have an absolutely ridiculous broadside weight but if you just stopped at well here's the broadside weight at x number of pounds per gun you could be left with a false impression of these ships being incredibly lethal whereas in fact as we know with essex um you could just be knocked apart by someone with long guns who sits slightly outside the range of your carronades a tub of butter asks is there any correction necessary for the magnus effect in long-range gunnery in terms of fire control correction not particularly the magnus effect does exist because obviously very again very crudely speaking you can describe a shell 
as a rotating cylinder traveling through the air. However, it is rotating perpendicular to its direction of motion. So although that does generate a degree of Magnus effect, the effect of crosswind is going to be far more significant. Um, but where you do need to calculate for the Magnus effect is in your shell design itself, because the any forces generated by the Magnus effect will act on a shell's center of pressure, not its center of gravity. So if you have a situation where, for example, your center of pressure on a shell is right near the front and your center of gravity is about two thirds of the way back, which considering you've got a windscreen and uh, armor piercing cap and everything, that may very well be the case, then that's going to be a very unstable shell. And that can be a problem because the Magnus effect will push it off course and then air resistance and everything will take over. So when you're designing your shells, you have to take into account the Magnus effect. But if you can get the center of pressure and center of gravity alignment correct, then you the Magnus effect will actually make your shell more stable in flight, which is usually good. Unless, of course, you make it too stable in flight, in which case it goes back to being bad again. Crack Muppet asks, time for a pumping question. Could you talk about bilge pumps, specifically their evolution over time, how they worked a thousand years ago, if they were present back then, compared to how they function as technology advanced? Are there any additional variations determined by the design of ship? And how do they impact the design of bilges? So bilge pumps go back a fair old way. If some accounts are to be believed, they actually go back to the dawn of a very large ship building in Western Europe, which would be the Greco-Roman period. I suppose that's Europe generally. Um, but in any case, in the more recent periods, kind of the age of sail, etc., they were fairly standard manual pumps. And as the name suggests, used to pump out the bilges, i.e. the lowest depths of the ship, if water got in there. They weren't present on all ships. On smaller ships, they might not have a pump at all. You might just be down to bailing with buckets. Um, but most ships of any kind of substantial size would have a pump of some description or possibly more than one. Um, if you ever go to see the Mary Rose, for example, one of the longest single pieces of timber remaining on the Mary Rose is a tree trunk that's been hollowed out to form the pipe for a bilge pump. So that one end would be down in the hold, the other end would be up on deck, you then hand crank the pump, and when the water comes out you, you can send it over the side. Now, on a lot of ships of the period, it would run pretty much as that. The pump would be up on the upper deck and water would just be sluiced over the side. However, when you're looking at warships in the classic age of sail, this was a bad idea because you could easily get the pump head knocked off by incoming gunfire. And so you'll see that whilst some ships might have a pump or two that does actually go up to deck level, on a lot of age of sail warships, full warships, that is like Constitution and Victory, the pumps might only come up to the upper gun deck, or in the case of a frigate, the gun deck, because this is a slightly more protected area from which the water could then either be sent out the gun ports, or in some of the more advanced cases, there might be a secondary pump that just goes up another level. Um, and then if you lose that, it's not quite as bad as if you lose the full depth of them. And as you can see here from this patent, as time advanced, the pumps got more advanced, uh, initially still being hand cranked, but now using metal pipe work and metal boxes, etc., which were a bit more efficient. And then as you go forward further still, once you get steam power and then diesel power, auxiliary electricity and so forth, you start to get mechanically driven and electrically driven pumps, which relieve the crew of the duty. But the technology, once it's established in any given generation, doesn't really change all that much depending on the design of ship. It will usually just be more or less bilge pumps depending on the size of the vessel and bigger or smaller bilge pumps also depending on the size of the vessel. Of course if a ship is designed to carry a certain type of cargo you may also have a slightly different type of pump. Um, so for example if you have a ship that's divided up into lots of individual compartments like say a cruise liner or an ocean liner back in the day when ocean liners were around because they're better than cruise liners um, 
then you could have pumps running up the middle of the ship, running up the centre line, because that's the most efficient way of getting water out of the bottom. Whereas if you have a bulk carrier, like a um, grain carrier, for example, or an oil carrier, then you might have the pumps, or at least the pipe work for the pumps, running up the sides of the ship, because you don't want to stick a pump like that through the middle of your main cargo carrying uh, volume. Generally speaking, they don't play any significant part in sewage management. Uh, on an age of sail ship, the ship's heads obviously are straight over the side of the ship, so a build pump would have nothing to do with it. And later on, once the ship's heads are internal, um, well, the bilges are the lowest portion of the ship, but they are still a portion of the ship, quite commonly accessible in the machinery spaces. You can imagine you really, 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 really do not want sewage in those areas. So... Uh, the onboard sewage systems for ships would have tanks or vents that are completely separate from the bilge pump system. Apart from anything else, the bilge pumps have to get uh, the water from the bottom of the ship to the top, so you don't want solid objects of any way, shape or form getting in the way, and it's bad enough with the stuff that accumulates in the bilges normally. Although, of course, if you have internal plumbing and something goes wrong, then most of the stuff that leaks will probably inevitably some at some point end up down in the bilges. At uh, which point, yeah, that's not going to be fun. Logan W. asks, Was dowsing magazines with water in the event of an out-of-control fire to avoid blowing them up ever common practice? Yes, for as long as pumps and sprinklers and pipes that could access the ship's magazine existed, dowsing the magazines with water in the event of a significant fire was pretty much standard. That isn't to say if a fire breaks out anywhere on the ship you immediately flood the magazines, but if a fire breaks out near the magazines then one of the common things to do was to flood them as soon as possible now that could be near as in horizontal proximity or it could be near as in vertical proximity like say for example the turrets on fire good idea to flood the magazines at that point of course if you do flood the magazines you're almost certainly going to render all of the propellant completely useless so that is basically permanently disabling the turret that that magazine is supplying or the guns or the mounting depending on whatever so it is a little bit of a serious decision so it's not you know completely on a whim but that's why you have controls both within and without the magazines as you can see here this is on hms belfast where you can either completely flood them or you can activate a sprinkler system to damp everything down and that gives you a little bit of leeway because of course the other thing is if you flood the magazines you're admitting a lot of water to the ship which may not help with its buoyancy especially if you're being attacked which is probably why you're flooding the magazines in the first place um so if you're just generally worried about fire potentially spreading but you want to keep firing um then the sprinkler system might be your way to go because that will damp everything down and assuming that the charges are stored in their proper cases then a quick sprinkling might not actually render them completely useless but will make it harder for sparks and flash to spread a little bit but you are slightly taking your life into your own hands there and you see this on multiple ships that come under heavy attack at various points uh, in the coverage of the torpedoing of uss north carolina as covered with rear admiral henderson we saw that they were worried about there's possibly smoke in one of North Carolina's forward magazines. So the response was, OK, get everybody out there and flood the magazine, douse it with water. Uh, similarly, we know there was at least one magazine fire aboard Bismarck before she sank in one of the secondary magazines. And, well, that was a major problem. They had to actually seal that off because by the time anyone realised what was going on, everyone inside was dead and the controls to flood it were inaccessible. But we also know that at least some, if not all, of Bismarck's main magazines were at various points flooded during the course of her sinking in order to avoid the fires that were elsewhere on the ship spreading and just blowing the ship apart. Uh, and then likewise you have things like on Seidlitz where magazines were flooded because adjacent magazines were on fire and so on and so forth. And finally, Lord Quack, King of the Ducks, asks, You've mentioned the reason the Royal Navy has royal in its name is because the early monarchs actually owned the ships versus the army, which represents the nation. Yeah, and the first standing British army was founded during the Commonwealth or Republican period. Um... Why is the RAF royal? Did whichever monarch that was in power at the time actually own the first aircraft? And related to that, why is it the fleet air arm instead of the royal fleet air arm as the, that represents the Royal Navy? 
The Royal Air Force was, of course, formed out of the merger of the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps, but the main reason it's known as the Royal Air Force is that um, it's not related to who owned the aircraft specifically, which is the origin of the Royal Navy, but, as I said, the British Army was founded as a standing force pretty much by the Commonwealth-Republican era, so its initial founding was just, it was declared as effectively the army, whereas the Royal Air Force, when it was founded, was declared by royal proclamation and was styled as the Royal Air Force at the time. So basically King George V said, this is my air force. As for why the fleet air arm isn't the Royal Fleet air arm, that's because the fleet air arm, of course, didn't exist initially, though you had the Royal Naval Air Service. Then there was a brief period when everything was RAF, and then in 1924, you had the fleet air arm formed as a division of the Royal Air Force. So much like you have you know, the Royal Navy, but although all Navy ships carry the Appalachian HMS, which is currently His Majesty's ships, um, you don't have a Royal Appalachian for every ship. So it's not like the Royal First Battle Division or First Royal Battle Division or First Royal Destroyer Squadron. Those are internal administrative titles. And at the time the Fleet Air Arm was formed, it was an internal administrative unit of the Royal Air Force. And then once it transferred over to the Royal Navy, well, they'd already had their name changed once, so might as well keep it as is. And that brings us to the end of this week's Patreon Dry Dock. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I apologise if I sounded a little bit out of it in places. As I said, jet lag is a bit of a killer. But it's done, and we're back on our regularly scheduled events, at least for the moment. 